I, I tell you what, the, the music just, the, everything this morning has just been so beautiful. I uh, think about our children in the church and the children in our community, and I hear what Patrona was talking about, like the awkwardness of kids of not knowing how to engage with one another. You know, that just breaks my heart. It's, it's just not good. Um, I want to pray for our kids. And um, I want you guys to know, like as a church, we're making plans to, to get our children's ministry up and running. Um, so there's a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes. I want you to know that it is going to happen. And if you're at home with your children, I want you to know uh, soon you'll be getting... Um, some communication regarding this. Uh, we got to make sure we're ready and that we're doing everything appropriately and following uh, the guidelines of our, um, of our state right now. But we love our kids and we love our families and, and we recognize this has been so hard on them and it's hard on our kids. And our church is a church that wants to welcome kids. We want to be a church that just opens the doors up all every door that we can open up in this church and invite the kids in and, and I could just just remember that Jesus loves me this I know I pray that that this is the heart of our church is just pouring it out on children let's just pray for the kids again this morning Lord I I just pray for the children of this church heavenly father God for their minds Lord To having the freedom just to be, to not worry about all the cares of a life that adults are supposed to take care of. Lord, um, comfort their hearts and their minds. And, and Lord, I pray that they would be encouraged. God, that they'd be a, a demonstration to us as a church of how to act, Lord that we'd be like children, more free, more loving, less burdened, and trusting you more, Lord. God, we just commit the children of this church into your hands, Lord, and the children's ministry, and our youth ministries, Lord. God, uh, may this be a church that is known for loving kids. And we just thank you for this in Jesus' name, amen. Whew. All right. Praise God. Amen. Oh, he is so good to us. We got a loving Savior and a loving God. And um, this morning I'm, I'm jumping on a new um, topic. And it's all still centered around the unity of Christ because Christ is the middle of everything in our lives as followers of Christ. Jesus is the center. But I want to talk about unity Unity in, in the church and, and unity in our relationship with God. And, um, and I have some Legos this morning. So kids, I have the toy that you want to play with. Sorry. <laughs> Don't be mad. Um, and I know some families in here are exceptional Lego-ers, whatever that is. Um, I'm not. So I can, I'm probably the worst Lego put together -er there ever was. But... You know, a Lego, here's like a Lego person. And this Lego all by itself, I'm sure it can have its own fun and it could be its own person. But it really does not know its true purpose and meaning unless it is connected in the life that it was designed to be in. And as a Christian and as a follower of Christ our place and our connection to one another and unified together. And piece by piece, piece by piece, I'm not going to try to build something. If you're just wondering, okay, that's not going to happen. That would be really clever. But it would be super awful. But piece by piece, we build this beautiful thing. And each piece is an individual piece. Each piece has a purpose in being put together, in being built 
up. In creating something beautiful and amazing that we call the church. Every piece, as we read in Ephesians chapter 4, 16 on, a tendon, a ligament, every part of the body of Christ. And I want to encourage you this morning to know that God has a place for you in this church, but he has a place for you in the overall church of God, that he has a purpose in your life to serve him, to be committed to him, and to be connected one to another. And that's the beautiful thing about the church, being connected one to another. And if we look up, uh, this wasn't Webster's definition uh, of unity, this is I just uh, pulled this up off of a, a basic uh, definition of unity. It says, the state of being one or oneness, a whole or totality is combining all its parts into one. The state or fact of being united or combined into one, as of the parts of a whole, unification. The absence of diversity, unvaried or uniform character, oneness of mind, feeling, etc., as among a number of persons, concord, harmony, or agreement. And I think it's important for us to understand that, you know, when we become one as a unit, as part of a church, you don't lose your uh, personality. <laughs> um, you don't lose who God created you to be. He has just um, designed something very unique and special to advance the kingdom of God, and you're a part of it. Open up your Bibles, if you would. Um, I'm, I'm going to do curveball this morning since, since we're on that track today. Open up to John 17. I was reading, and I was like, you know what? I can't not preach on unity without using this. And go to, let's go to verse... Oh, let's go back just a little bit um, to verse 19, John 17, 19. So here's Jesus fixing to be betray uh, betrayed by Judas in the garden. And Jesus knows his time's near. And he has some very, very specific words for his disciples. Verse 19, he says, and, and for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me. And I in you, that they also may be one in us. And that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them. That they may be one just as we are one. In them and you and me. And that they may be made perfect in one. That the world may know that you have sent me. And have loved them as you have loved me. In verse 20 it says, I do not pray for these alone but also for those who will believe. The unity that Jesus is speaking about, he uses very specific language. He uses language that is so close in unity between God the Father and God the Son, and he relates that same language to us as the church of being a part of the church and following after him. Our relation to him being one with the Father. If we can just rest our minds just for a moment and think about the oneness of God the Father and God the Son. And Christ is using very specific language in this and he's relating it to you and me together in the church. There's a structure within that. There's an order within that. 
within that unity. I can't help but think of what it would look like, not just in this church, but the universal church. That we would see Protestants and Lutherans and Catholics and Baptists and all of us coming together under the banner of Christ, all connecting under one mission to serve God, to humble ourselves before Him and to advance the kingdom of God. See, sometimes we get so caught up in things that can take us off track. Sure, there may be theological differences within them, but isn't our purpose to advance the kingdom? Right? So this is our mindset, and this is the mindset of our church, that we would lay aside our personal desires, our personal preferences, that we could set that aside and, and come together under the banner of Christ, being united, united together to advance the kingdom of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, y'all turn there with me if you would. We're going to rip through some scriptures. And I'm going to have to go really fast because I just looked at the time. We're going to be late. I'm going to tell you that right now. It's happening. Just plan on it. We'll get you home for the Seahawks Cowboys game. Amen? <laughs> yeah. Ephesians 2, 17, it says, And he came and preached peace to you who were far off. And to those who were near, and through him both have access by one spirit to the Father. The unity in, the, in being followers of Christ is no longer a picture of a special person group, but we are united under the banner of Christ by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? And if we go back to Ephesians 2.13, it says, But now in Christ Jesus you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. I love it that we have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. This is the thing that really unites us. If we look at Colossians 3.15, I'm just going to read it so we can roll. Colossians 3.15 says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you also were called in one body and be thankful. We're united in Christ's death and in his life. And see, this is our identification now as followers of Jesus Christ. It is not in our own personal self. We're identified with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ because that is who we are now. We're a new life and a new creation because of the work that Christ did. And when we come together under that banner, we're united together under the banner of Christ. And it's a beautiful thing. And, and here's, here's what's so wonderful. Romans 6, 5 says, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. I, um, I like to keep things really real. And um, sometimes in the church, we, we can just kind of build ourselves up Maybe, maybe bigger than what we should. And um, because we've been going to church and prayer meeting and been teaching and doing all these things, that we can elevate ourselves to thinking that, that we're maybe holier than somebody else, right? And it's really easy to do. It's, it's not hard to do. I mean, it's all throughout the Old Testament scriptures. We see in the New Testament scriptures between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the relationship they had. I mean, it's, it's easy for us to elevate ourselves, it's easy for us to puff up and build ourselves up. And the thing that is so unifying for us as believers in Christ is recognizing who we once were before we knew him. Do you understand? You're no longer that person. Let that set just for a second. You've been made new by the blood of Christ. 
This is a unifying thing in the church because when we come all together, we recognize that we're all sinners, that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. And if we keep that in and remember that's who we once were, but knowing that, that that's not who we are, it's a beautiful picture. We, we can't elevate ourselves any higher than anybody else because we know that we've all came from the same place. We were all sinners. We were all walking in darkness and the futility of our minds and walking in, the, in our own flesh. But here comes Jesus who broke down the wall between man and God, that we have direct access to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's so unifying. There's nothing that, can, that anybody can elevate themselves on because we all have direct access to God through the blood of Christ. Amen? It's because of Christ's death, because of his resurrection, and because of what he did on that cross, we are unified together by the blood of Jesus. I pray that we understand and know that this morning because it brings a, a, a measure of humility in our hearts that when we look at our brothers and sisters who are struggling in their life, look, there are people in this room, and I guarantee you, that are struggling with addictions on their computers. There's people who are struggling in this church with alcohol. There's people that are struggling in this church with overeating. There's people in this church that are struggling with lying. There's people in this church that are probably struggling with cheating. There's probably people in this church that when they go to their job, they're not known as a Christian. But if we humble ourselves, when we know and understand that we're all sinners, see, sometimes people walk inside these doors and they think they're being judged. It's something that they build up oftentimes in their own mind because of the conviction of their hearts. But let them walk into the door and feel the love of Christ. Amen? Let them walk inside this church and know that we are united by Christ in his love for his children. Amen? Oh, Lord. We're united by God's holiness. Turn to Hebrews 12. Twenty-eight. I'm going to see what's so awesome is, you know, the foundation of this, of this church that's being built, the chief cornerstone of this is Christ Jesus. And the beautiful language of the church, we see that we've been given a new name that we're a royal priesthood, that we've been set apart. Hebrews 12, 28 through 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. I think oftentimes we say things like, uh, you know, God is my homie, right? Lord, um, it, it's nice to know that we have that comforting, close friendship with God, but we must never forget that he is holy. We must never Forget the holiness of God. And in him, there is no darkness. 
oftentimes our view of who God is, we just try to confine him. And we, and we lack the reverence of who he is. And that can pervade inside the church. And in our lives, it's simple. 1 Peter chapter 1, 13 through 23. So if you're in Hebrews, just turn over. You'll, you'll be right there. 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read quite a few verses here. Hang with me. Therefore, when you've prepared your minds for action, being self-controlled, put your hope completely in the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former desires you used to conform to in your ignorance. But as the one who called you is holy, you yourselves be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, you will be holy because I am holy. Let's just stop there for a second. I can remember in youth ministry, we, we went to a, a creation festival and this guy was talking about the holiness of God and, and the decisions that we make in our lives. And one of the things that he said was, take that decision and hold it up into the light and the holiness of God. Is it holy? And I know that there's minuscule decisions that we make in our life that that doesn't really probably connect with, but we can look inside our lives Oftentimes the decisions that we make and the lifestyle that we're living. See, God has set apart the church for his work. God has set us aside to advance the kingdom of God. That he has woven us, united one to another under the banner of Christ to advance his kingdom. And it's important, just like having elders in the church, that we guard the church. See, there's disunity too, right? It's when sometimes people come in with the flavor of the day, the new doctrine, the new teaching, the new thing that the world is celebrating. And they want to take that, and the church being so seeker-friendly is willing to sacrifice the holiness of God to advance their agenda. In order to be who God has called us to be, we have to guard our hearts and we have to guard our minds and we have to guard the church. And I'm telling you this morning, it's not just the eldership's job to do that in the church. See, there has been something that has creeped into churches in not just our country, but all across the world, that it's somehow a thing that the pastor is has to be super funny, super entertaining, super engaging. The music in the church, you need to have a light show, a smoke show, a laser show, right? There has to be jumping. You have to pop and lock and do all the stuff that you're supposed to do, right? You know what I mean? It's like all these things that we have to do inside the church to try to be engaging to the community.
What have we done? Sure, church, I would love to have new carpet in this church. I think it would be more inviting for us. Sure, church, I would like to not have blue walls. I think it would be amazing. And I don't believe that's vanity inside the church. But it's important that we're guarding the church. We're guarding the things that we allow to come in here and dictate what message is being spoken. See, Jesus didn't need all that. Granted, there weren't cars back then. (laughs) And there weren't projectors. But I pray that we don't lose sight of the holiness of God and, and lose what God has called us to do of being united together and advancing the kingdom. See, I don't believe you can read the gospel message that looks inside the church that doesn't have an expectation that each person inside the church is following after Christ, that is reading the scripture, that is pursuing God. I don't believe you'll read that in the scripture. That God has called us to be united together, to encourage one another, to love on one another in such a way that we affect the world outside. We come together in such a way that is so dedicated to God Not in a legalistic way, but in a way that we know that we're sinners saved by His grace. That we love people in such a way that when you come in contact with them, they know that you love Christ. And it doesn't just happen when people walk inside these doors. It's when we leave here. When we we step outside these doors and you run into people in your life who have been hurt who are broken, that are broke. See, here's something. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just rattle some cages this morning. In Acts, it's, we see the love of the church in such a way that there was nobody that was wanting or in need. There was such a love in the heart of the people inside the church that they took care of one another. We rely so heavily on a government system to come in and to take care of God's people. I pray that there's such a love in our hearts that we begin to understand and see people in our church that are hurt, that are in need, that the Holy Spirit would reveal to you in your heart what to do. That we're so united and connected that we're in prayer with one another, that we we begin to understand and see needs inside the church. There have been people who have dropped off checks to this church for exact dollar amounts in our life that we needed at the right time. I have no idea who they were. I have no idea about any of it, but I know that God spoke to them and the Holy Spirit ministered to their heart And they blessed my family. See, God, our money's His. And it's not just that, it's our time too, right? See, we're united by His love and the love for one another. And so there's a role, right? I mean, I I just don't want to say that there's not a role in our, in our culture for our government to help people. That's not what I'm saying. I, w- I want to make that very clear. But I just want to, I want to say inside of our church, may we, may we be known in such a way of loving one another. First John. So y'all in First Peter, just flip the script a little bit more. We're just going to roll right through. First John chapter 4.
And I know I didn't read all of 1 Peter 13 to 23. Don't hold me to the fire on that. First John chapter 4, 7 through 8. And then we're going to skip down to 19. Dear friends, let us love one another. Because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been fathered by God and knows God. And the one who does not know God because God is love. Verse 19 through 21. We love because he loved us first. If anyone says I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has sent is not able to love God whom he has not seen. And this is the commandment we have from him that the one who loves God should love his brother also. That's the audio version. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Praise the Lord. Um, when we're united together in the church, and it's what was beautiful is hearing our brother talk about a relationship in the eldership team that literally brought our brother to tears even thinking about. And my prayer is for our church of growing together that we build those types of relationships. And right now it seems difficult with the way things are set up. But I want to challenge you to be intentional. See, I know growing up and, and raising kids, I was always really horrible at this. Um, I worked these crazy hours. I know I've talked about this a bunch of times. And I was just talking with a brother before church. You know, I used to start at noon. And I'd work noon till midnight a lot of times. And finding opportunities to spend time with your children is, could be difficult. And so being intentional in those relationships is important. You have to almost literally sometimes just put it on a calendar. I know um, there's brothers in the church here that we got to put it on the calendar. That way it happens. And I want to encourage you, church, to look across the aisles of this church. Just take a moment. Look around. It's okay. And think about that face this week. Connecting. Connecting with one another. And building unity in the church, in our lives. See, um, oftentimes we would do the yard bomb with the youth ministry, and we would go to different houses. And, and the only way that we were able to find out sometimes in the church that there were needs is because we went to their house and saw them. Oftentimes people, are, they just feel like they're, they're bothering the church by bringing up things that are going on, right? But when you're able to go out there and put eyes on it, you begin to understand the needs. And see, that's what happens in the church when the church is unified and connected. We're going to be able to do that in a way that demonstrates the love of Christ. See, it happens both ways. It's relation, relational. Okay? So, I want you to know it's okay to, to be in need. And it's okay to let people come into your life and to help. Amen? I got to end.
just one, one thing I need, I want to bring up. God has been using brothers and sisters to speak a lot of things into me lately, and I'm listening. Ooh, um, we make assumptions of one another in the church. Sorry. Uh, raise your hand if you've been going here more than 10 years. Raise, keep it up if you've been here 15. Okay. Chances are you've stepped on one of the other person's hands that was raised. Toes. Right? Right? You've said something that's hurt somebody's feelings. You've given somebody a cross look. You didn't help when they were in need. I don't need to fill in all the blanks. You know what I'm talking about. If you've been in church long enough, you know. And then we begin to assume a lot of things about one another. It's dangerous inside the church. And we need to pray that God will begin to unravel those things, that we will have such open communication and dialogue with one another that we will not allow the devil to put his foot in the door. Because all it takes is just a foot holding the door open. We have a responsibility by what Christ has called not just his disciples, but we read in John 17... The prayer that Christ gave was that we would be unified in such a way that it, ex that it exemplified the relationship between Christ and His Heavenly Father. That is lofty expectation. But we are united by the blood of Christ. We're not united simply by flesh, but we are the temple of God, the residence of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. And I believe God in a unified church who humbles themselves before the Lord that God will move in a way that will be impactful in this church and in your life and in your home in your job in your neighborhood let's pray Heavenly Father We are one in the Spirit, and we are one in the Lord. God, and we look forward to the day where we'll be fully restored and we stand in your presence. God, and it will be perfect. We look forward to the day where there'll be no more pain and no more sorrow and no more hurt, no more trouble. God, that we will be basking in your presence and in your glory. God, we fix our eyes on that time. Oh, Lord, and just knowing that one day, because we know you, that we will be with you. But until then, God, may we have unity, not in just the universal church, but in this church, South Hill Christian Church, God, I pray that you would just reveal to us in our hearts the things that have stopped that from happening.
God, that we would take the assumptions that we've built up one to another, that we would lay them at your feet, that we could love our brothers and sisters rightly. God, teach us. God, show us. Lord, we need you. Lord, we need you in our lives. Oh, Lord, we cannot do this life without you. Oh, Lord. I pray for this church, Lord God. I pray for this church. Lord, and I pray for the leadership of this church. I pray for our youth pastor. I pray for the children's ministry. Lord God, I pray for the women's and the men's. And, and, and Lord, we pray for those who are involved in the health care ministry in our church. God, may we be so united in this church that we would advance the kingdom of God that people who walk into these doors, Lord, and the people that we come in contact outside of here, God, that would know the love of Christ because you live within us. Oh, Lord, may you be glorified in all that we say, in all that we do, Heavenly Father. And we just commit the rest of our time, Lord, and, and I pray, God, as, as we sing this last song this morning, God, that you would be glorified, that you would just touch the hearts of each one in this church. We just ask this in the strong and the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You believe that this morning, church? Oh, what a mighty God we serve. Amen. Praise God. God, we just pray for this church. We pray for your people, Lord. God, I pray that you would use this church and the people in this room to glorify you, Lord, with their lives. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 God bless you, church. God bless you, Stern family. Thank you.